Welcome to Censored number 136. The title of the article is Please No Change by William J. Eisman, PhD. But before I read the article, I'd like to uh, read a few scriptures from the Bible, which I believe uh, Republican uh, right wing religionists must uh, pass over or uh, don't know much about. First is prove all things, hold fast that which is good. That's 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21. He that op oppresses the poor to increase his riches, and he that gives to the rich shall surely come to want. Proverbs 22, verse 16. He that makes haste to be rich shall not be innocent. Proverbs 28, verse 20. As the nail sticks to the stone, so sin sticks to buying and selling. Ecclesiastes 27, verse 2. And now to the article. If it was not clear to all before this recent presidential primary race, <clears throat> excuse me, Americans are afraid of change and revolution. Bernie Sanders hit all the right notes and issues needing change in order for us to take back our government and improve our economy. Yet Bernie does not have the delegates needed to be chosen as the Democratic candidate to run for the President of the United States, for the office of the President of the United States. The status quo and a faux progressive is regarded as a shoe in Donald Trump is no revolutionary, so we cannot take him seriously. And nobody has heard of Jill Stein. Bernie attracted the young and independence to his revolution and his bid to change those things that need changing. In New York, Bernie got 65% of the voters under age 30. These angry young voters came out of the Occupy Wall Street movement and are well aware of the hold the 1% have on our economy and our political system. It is devastating to learn that one-tenth of the 1% now has as much wealth as the bottom 90% of Americans. Wealth is controlled by a tiny handful of individuals. Many Americans must believe that the wage and wealth gap are natural phenomena. They must be ignorant of how trade deals don't, have, don't benefit us as individuals or as a nation. Sanders is against such trade deals. He was against NAFTA. These trade deals benefit the super rich and huge corporations and satisfy none of the needs of ordinary workers. Over 30 years of wage stagnation has blown the American dream and our political stability. Still, many Americans fear needed change and they fear Bernie Sanders. American capitalism is wrapped up with the flag, Christianity, mom, apple pie, and Chevrolet. During the Cold War with the Soviet Union, it was godless communism versus Christian America. Capitalism's flaws were tolerated or dismissed. Capitalism involves private property, contracts, and the rule of law. John Maynard Keynes said, Capitalism is the extraordinary belief that the nastiest of men, for the nastiest of motives, will somehow work for the benefit of all. Privatization has given us higher food prices and a decline in human rights. Under capitalism, there is no solution to persistent poverty. Capitalism automatically generates a growing level of income and wealth inequality. 
Capitalism fails to pay a living wage to millions of American workers. Capitalism may not produce, produce enough jobs due to automation. Capitalism allows businesses not to be charged the full social costs of their activities. Capitalism without regulation exploits the environment and natural resources. Capitalism creates business cycles and economic instability. Capitalism emphasizes individualism and self-interest at the expense of community and the commons. Capitalism also encourages high consumer debt and leads to a financially driven rather than a producer driven economy. Capitalism lets politicians and business interests collaborate to subvert the economic interests of the majority of citizens. Capitalism favors short run profit planning over a long run investment planning. Our form of capitalism is not regulated for product quality, safety, truth in advertising, and anti-competitive behavior. Our form of capitalism tends to focus narrowly on a GDP growth. Social values and happiness are absent from these market equations. As we have seen, Western capitalism is beset with problems. Around the world, some five to seven billion people are poor or extremely poor. In America, the poverty rate between 1993 and 2001 was 11%. And in 2008, it was 13.2%. In 2012, it jumped to 16%. Jesus was right when he said, the poor would always be with us. Right-wing Christian Republicans complain that we spend too much money on the poor and we need to cut their benefits. The fact is, we have never spent enough on the poor. The Republicans' simple solution to the poor is jobs. There were no jobs in the Great Depression. And there weren't enough jobs in our Great Recession, 2007-2008, which has not ended for more than 80% of Americans. Jobs were being outsourced, but not being created in the United States. To lift people out of poverty, they need an income, not just food stamps. They need an annual income. An annual income would do away with many social programs. This would uplift and simplify things. But Republicans do not want to lift up the poor. They want to punish them. An annual income is a hand up and not a put down. America's poverty level is 28th in the world. Yet food stamps were cut by 7%. And many single men were thrown off the rolls. This is a shame for the richest country in the world to have poor. To be a light unto the world, we must rid our country of poverty. Welfare for profitable corporations is the devil's economics. A myth has taken hold of American economics that tax cuts for the rich will create jobs. We have cut taxes on the rich since the 1980s and the only jobs created were in China and India. What creates jobs is demand. Tax cuts for the rich are simply added to profits. 
the tax rate was 75% in 1939, and people were making profits. During World War II, the rate on incomes over $200,000 was 91%, and people were making profits. In 1964, the rate was 70%, and in 1981, before Ronald Reagan began his dickering with the tax system, the rate was 50%, and then 38.5%. Ronald Reagan, the saint of tax cutting, cut taxes 11 times. Excuse me, raised taxes 11 times. Under Bill Clinton, the rate was 39.6%. And people were making profits. George W. Bush had taxes cut in 2002, and the lost revenues amounted to $1.8 trillion. Again, tax cuts for the rich do not create jobs. Demand creates jobs. All around the world, workers are exploited by their particular economic systems. Here in America, it is Western capitalism, or monopoly capitalism. Bernie Sanders wanted a $15 an hour minimum wage. Right now, the $7 and 25 cents, excuse me, minimum wage is not a living wage. From 1990 to 2000, the top 1% of earners increased their share of national income from 14% to 22 percent. While the 99 percent of earners witnessed their share drop from 86 percent to 78 percent. Companies are not paying higher wages and are placing the burden on taxpayers to pay for food stamps and other social costs. If the minimum wage had kept up with productivity growth, it would be more than $17 an hour today. In 1973, manufacturing accounted for 22% of GDP, while today it is only 9%. And these jobs are gone. Technology also destroys jobs. Capitalism as we know it imposes serious environmental and social costs. Business pollutes and destroys with no regard for cleanup or reconstruction. Companies are allowed to do what they want. True, they may someday be fined, but fines are not appropriate punishment for those who have money. Companies are even allowed to mess with our food, GMOs. The business cycle is inherent in unregulated capitalism. Since 1857, the United States has experienced 33 recessions. The anatomy of a recession is as follows. Contraction, trough, expansion, peak. Overproduction occurs and demand slows, and layoffs and job losses result. Since 1945, we have suffered 11 recessions, about one every six years. This type of activity to restate is intrinsic to American type capitalism. Adam Smith said, that prerequisites to capitalism were morality and decency. But capitalism being rooted in individualism and individual rewards, self-interest, is subject to fraud and corruption and not caring about the other guy. 
Contrast this with socialism, which emphasizes the common good. There are also different types of capitalism. It was announced on June 22, 2016, that Social Security recipients and others would receive a cost of living increase of 0.2% next year. Cost of living increases are paid when the cost of living increases according to the CPI, the Cost of Living Increase Index. For decades, the government has been cheating on calculating the CPI and cost of living increases. Not included in the inflation index is food, energy, health care problems, I mean health care premiums, excuse me, well, they are problems, and education costs. These are important areas of our economy and our costs. Because of this, the CPI is kept artificially low, which results in lower cost of living increases. After the 2007-2008 financial meltdown, the top 5% of American taxpayers recovered. In 2012, the incomes of the top 1% rose about 20% while the remaining 99% only enjoyed a 1% increase. The top 1% are those who make over $350,000 and they are investors. They are not consumers per se. The poor and the middle class spend their income on 70% of the economy. Knowing this, it is easy to see why income inequality would slow the economy. American capitalism is corporate capitalism. When we lower taxes on corporations, we deplete government budgets. Lobbying has now become a marketing activity. Bribery is the new norm. Politics distorts the outcomes of capitalism. Capitalism offers us nothing but profit to enhance our happiness. It is cooperation and free giving that make us happy, not competition. Studies show that our happiness increases at about $75,000 a year. And as the money grows higher, Happiness is no longer correlated with income. Many GDP activities do not contribute to more happiness or well-being. For our well-being, we need sufficient food, clothing, shelter, being healthy, being educated, having a job and skills, and having unpolluted air and water. American capitalism does not provide for our well-being. In the United States, 15% of us fall below the poverty line and that is about 50 million citizens. This indicates that the economy is not working for the vast majority of us. Our economy is working for probably 20% of us. If the goal of a capitalistic economy is to eliminate poverty, then capitalism fails in a miserable way. Our form of capitalism seems to perpetuate poverty. If this is all true, and it is, why do we continue to defend such a system? Even the God of the Bible is not a capitalist. Our form of capitalism has triumphed only in the West. Capital makes the capitalistic system go round. 
assets can generate capital. Money is only one form of capital. Capitalism needs property rights before money can be made. Money presupposes property. Because of this, capitalism serves only as a only a privileged few. Capitalism is not equitable. And as to upward mobility, people often only get one chance in a lifetime to be successful, if they are lucky. Capitalism may reward the risk taker, and taking risk is a function of wealth. Crises are a normal feature of a capitalistic economy. There is an overproduction tendency in capitalism. Capitalism exploits labor. Capitalism is simply the investment of money in the expectation of making a profit. Under this system, workers are wage slaves and survival of the fittest prevails in private enterprise. Under our form of capitalism, the freedoms of the workers are illusory. This is because in a capitalist society, it is hard to survive without paid work and little choice of work or employer may be available. Capitalism pays homage to speculation. In our system, the poor must be forced to work. In capitalism, there is a conflict between employers and unions and among workers themselves. The Taft-Hartley Act of 1947 weakened unions' rights and powers. Yet under these conditions, people are dependent on wage labor for their survival. This is not a good thing, knowing that the true capitalist is motivated by amoral accumulation of money, and this frequently drives particular individuals to bend or break the rules. The Bernie Sanders revolution sought to address all these wrongs, and many more. But the democratic establishment, the adaptive supporters, would not budge from the status quo. They know that all is not well, but they are afraid of change. They may dip a toe into the water, but they are afraid to immerse the foot. With this, change never comes, and we are left with the same old, same old. The end. Welcome to How to Defeat a Conservative, Part 14, by William J. Eisenman, Ph.D. Chapter 11, Was America Founded on Christian Principles, Part 2. George Washington said that the government of the United States is in no way founded upon the Christian religion. Ignoring this simple historical fact, many conservatives and religious fundamentals, fundamentals want to rewrite history. They believe in a fantasy America, an America that never was. Since the founding of America, many of its religious sects have sought, in one way or another, to be the only church in town, to be the established religion. The Founding Fathers thought of themselves as deists, believing in reason rather than revelation. 
Thomas Jefferson preferred a benign religion. In the Age of Reason, Tom Paine attacked the Christian Church and its theology. He wrote that his own mind was his church. Tom Paine understood much when he said, all national institutions of churches, whether Jewish, Christian, or Turkish, appear to me to appear to me no other than human inventions set up to terrify and enslave mankind and monopolize power and profit. John Adams said this would be the best of all possible worlds if there were no religion in it. This clause appears in a treaty with the Arab nations of Tripoli, Algiers, and Tunis, as the government of the United States is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion as it has in itself no character of enmity against the law religion or tranquility of Muslim men. Samuel Austin, a DD, stated in 1811 that the lack of recognition of God was the capital defect in our Constitution. Yet today, conservative religionists claim that our Constitution is a Christian document. Someone is wrong. Are modern conservative Christians lying to further their repressive agenda? <clears throat> Thomas Jefferson disagreed with Justice Joseph Story when the justice declared that the First Amendment to the Constitution dealing with religious freedom had been adopted to encourage Christianity. In his A Memorial and Remonstrance, James Madison said of the influence that ecclesiastical establishments had on civil society, in no instance have they been the guardians of the liberties of the people. Long before the American Revolution and the birth of the United States, Religion has, in one way or another, tried to enhance its power by joining forces with the state. This still goes on today. Thomas Jefferson was well aware of the cruelty inherent in religious intolerance and of the tyranny that could result from a united church and state. He knew that in every country and in every age, the priest has been hostile to liberty. The priest is always in alliance with the despot and abets his abuses in return for protection of his own. Contrary to conservative propaganda, the founding fathers wanted no part of a united church and state. The founding fathers supported freedom of religion, not the establishment of a religion. Thomas Jefferson spoke for them when he said he was for freedom of religion and against all maneuvers to bring about the legal ascendancy of one sect over another. Jefferson felt that the Presbyterians were the loudest and the most intolerant. They were the most tyrannical and ambitious. They pant to establish law by another inquisition, which they can now only enforce by public opinion. Thomas Jefferson understood that without a revelation, there was not sufficient proof of God's existence. Jefferson said history did not furnish examples of a priest-ridden people 
maintaining a free civil government. John Adams and Sam Adams believed in the independence of church and parliament. The Founding Fathers also understood the need to restrain man with the chains of the Constitution. Thomas Jefferson argued that the state had no right to adopt an opinion on the matter of religion. He believed that the First Amendment grants us the freedom to worship and the freedom from the privileges and oppressions of a state church. All of this original intent is self-servingly brushed aside by rabid conservatives who want their way at all costs. James Madison was also hostile to, to religious establishments. He felt that religious bondage shackles and debilitates the mind and makes it unfit for every noble enterprise, every expanded prospect. Madison believed that religion was corrupted when established by law. He recognized the First Amendment as an all-inclusive injunction. To Madison, the separation of church and state was the great barrier against usurpations on the rights of conscience. <clears throat> this wall of separation between church and state was an important subject for the Founding Fathers. They understood completely that as long as this wall of separation was respected, so would be our liberties. The Founding Fathers were skeptical of man's virtue, and that is why they drafted a constitution with a Bill of Rights, and that is why our government is designed with checks and balances. None of the Founding Fathers, except Alexander Hamilton, would have liked one-man rule, despotism. With an established church comes dictatorship. If all this is true, then why do we continuously hear men of God calling for God in the classroom and on public property at Christmas time? Why do these same men of God involve themselves so deeply in the politics of this world? In John 12, verse 31, and John 14, verse 30, and John 16, verse 11, and Revelation 17, verse 2, and James 4, 4, we are told that Satan is the God of this world. The Bible warns time and again that the churches should not commit fornication with the kings of the earth. It is astounding how little those holding the Bible sacred know about it. Living in repressive times, the Founding Fathers understood the necessity of free correspondence and a free press. During their dark hours, they were forced to form committees of correspondence in order to communicate with each other. They preached independence with underground books and pamphlets. So when they created the Constitution, they made sure future generations would not have to experience what they did. The First Amendment Free Speech Clause was drafted to protect all forms of communication. In a letter to James Monroe in 1797, Thomas Jefferson wrote that a right of free correspondence between citizen and citizen on their joint interests, whether public or private, is not the gift of municipal law, either of England or Virginia 
or of Congress. But in common with all other natural rights, it is one of the objects for the protection of which society is formed and municipal laws established. Thomas Jefferson also wrote that our liberty depends on the freedom of the press. Jefferson held to this belief even when the press libeled him daily when he was President of the United States. Freedom of the press is not a Christian principle or a traditional family value. Thomas Jefferson understood that it was error alone that needed the support of government. Truth could stand on its own. At this time, it might be interesting to note what our Founding Fathers thought about sex. Ben Franklin exercised a liberal moral code. He liked body humor and believed that what works is moral. Franklin had a taste for earthy language. When he was young, he indulged in sex hungrily and secretly and without love. Marital infidelity was not a concern. During the 1750s, George Washington allowed his soldiers to bring mistresses to camp. Washington had a barracks room humor as part of his personality. He liked jokes about sex and told some. He had a barnyard view of animal passion. John Adams produced earthy writings and wrote, let every sluice of knowledge be opened and set a flowing. In college, James Madison wrote a scatological verse. Lechery, lust, and ribaldry occupied his mind. Men like these could not write a repressive constitution. Only men and women who believed with Alexander Hamilton that democracy was a poison could lie and claim that the Founding Fathers wrote the Constitution to protect and enhance religion and that freedom of the press excludes obscenity. Only the historically ignorant would dare claim that America was founded on Christian principles. And only those who were biblically unschooled would call Christian the myriad of different religious sects in America. In Luke 12, verse 32, the Bible says the true church of God would be a small, persecuted flock. The members of this church would be obeying the Ten Commandments, would be keeping God's holy days, and not Christmas or Easter. They would be keeping the Sabbath, the last day of the week, not the first. If God exists, then there is only one religion, His religion the only true religion. Romans 8, verses 6 through 9 and verse, oh, excuse me, and Romans 14. All else is of the devil. The United States is a unique country, and its founding fathers were unique in their thinking. These men set in motion an experimental form of government, a government where the individual is supreme and enjoys all the protections of law. The United States was founded upon reason, 
and individual liberty, not revelation. The Founding Fathers never envisaged an America where its politicians and courts have distorted the Bill of Rights and made of it not a protection of the minority, but a tyranny by a minority. From time to time, narrow-minded and emotionally immature politicians have impeded the progress of evolution of the United States, but they have not yet destroyed the American experiment. The machinery is in place to make the United States the healthiest and fairest nation on earth. We must, however, stop putting into positions of power those who are emotionally immature, close-minded, or stupid. It is these people who end up twisting and distorting the American system to serve their intolerant and perverted needs. Ultimately, this is our fault. We have not yet learned to vote for the cab driver with brains rather than the Ivy League politician. We are too impressed with money and power. We fall for fake values and virtues. We do not measure their hearts. We are dazzled by superficiality and outward appearance. We cannot keep America free, strong, and alive electing representatives the way we do. Although conservative Republicans and other ass-kissers for big business believe otherwise, money is the root of all evil in political campaigns. And as long as money talks in campaigns, we are doomed to continue making the same mistakes over and over again. Ending this calamity does not require that one be a Christian or even religious. The past shows us that Christians have failed to provide us with good government. Behind most censorship issues lurks religion. In America, most religious conservatives seem to have problems with premarital sex, public sex, and homosexuality. I apologize for the, uh, the phone interruption. The uh, receptionist is on the lunch, I suppose. So let me uh, read that last paragraph again. Behind most censorship issues lurks religion. In America, most religious conservatives seem to have problems with premarital sex, public sex, and homosexuality. They have an arrogant notion that God needs their help to clean up America. These people live in a dream world. They have a problem with freedom. Their religious propaganda and mysticism substitute for truth. It is in their mysticism where they are vulnerable. To be continued. The end. Welcome to the God Project from censor number 136 <clears throat> and the title is God is not a socialist by William J. Eisenman DD. God is not a communist. God is not a capitalist. And God is not a socialist. 
the God of the Bible has his own unique economic system. Pope Francis called capitalism the dung of the devil. Many people confuse God's economics with socialism. God's economics is about generosity. This generosity is one of free will. Quote, He that has two coats, let him impart to him that has none. Luke 3, verse 11. Also, quote, But he who has this world's goods and sees his brother have need and shuts up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwells the love of God in him? Unquote. As stated, God's people must have compassion and free will generosity. 1 John chapter 3 verse 17. The giver has a choice. God promises blessings for the giver and curses for the disobedient, a form of coercion. God's laws are automatic. God does not force anyone to obey his laws, which is a grave disappointment to right-wing counterfeit Christians who salivate at punishment. Sharing and being generous are biblical commands. Still, it is up to the person to decide to give and how much to give. Free will is essential to true Christianity. It is through free will that we develop character. Some say the early New Testament church was communistic or socialistic. The verse they point to is Acts 2, verse 44 through 45. The believers all kept together. They shared all they had with one another. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds among all, as anyone might be in need. Some say this was not communistic because it occurred under special circumstances on Pentecost when the apostles received the Holy Spirit. It was an exciting event and many were caught up in it. It would be well though to remember that Judas normally held the bag for the apostles, that is, money that was shared with each other and the poor. All this was generosity at work, not socialism, some say. Contrast the individual self-interest of capitalism and the interest in the common good in socialism. Many of these helped each other. John 9, verse 22. John 12, verse 42. They fulfilled a need, Acts 4, 32, and 35. This was private enterprise and private initiative and private ownership, not socialism. Socialism is the economic theory that the means of production should be owned or regulated by the government or the entire community. In a democracy, what would be wrong with that? In America, we, the people, are the government. So what could be bad about owning the means of production and have profits cover the costs of government 
rather than taxes. Wouldn't that be better than having robber barons in charge? Of the three major man-made economic systems, is not socialism the fairest? Remember, we are not talking about socialism being co-opted by totalitarianism. Socialism is an economic system, while totalitarianism is a political system. Some religionists claim that the parable of the talents was about wealth and money, Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30. But if that were true, God would be sanctioning, sanctioning usury interest. It actually concerned doing God's work while the master was away. God wants the able-bodied to work. 1 Timothy chapter 5 verses 8 verse 8 and 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 10 Acts 18 verses 1 through four. Yet sometimes circumstances may intervene and cause many of us to experience poverty. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 11. In God's economic system, land is distributed to families and if it is ever sold, it is returned to the original owner at the end of 50 years. Leviticus 25. Every seventh year, all debts are canceled. Deuteronomy 15 verses 1 through 2. In God's system of economics, all loans are interest-free, no usury. Leviticus 25 verses 36 through 7, 37. Lending was to be a voluntary action to help people. God promises to bless the giver. In Leviticus 19, verse 10, the wealthy are told to leave some of their field ungleaned so that the poor can work for their food. What we find is that the Bible does not advocate socialism, communism, or American capitalism. The Bible actually condemns our type of capitalism. 1 Timothy chapter 5 verses verse 18. Workers must not be exploited. Unions came into being to rid the workplace of exploitation and poor working conditions. What we find throughout America today is graft, immorality, deception, and dishonesty running rampant even in the halls of government. Our economic systems are evil because God says human nature is evil. Many people today are seeking another way without recognizing that our problems are moral problems, even our economics. God's economic system is better and fairer than what we have or can have. It is strange that those who call themselves Christian know nothing about God's economics and slavishly worship at the throne of crony capitalism. The End This has been a Megalife 21 production. Hi, this is William H. Morrow. 
The best way to join our organization is to get your free annual subscription to Newsletter Censored with your gift to support this work. The newsletter of hard-hitting truth and news-fighting censorship and conservative propaganda since 1977. There is nothing out there like the newsletter censored in the mainstream media or the press. This newsletter is the very best way to join and be a part of our organization. We're living in the end times, so you need newsletter censored. Go to www.newslettercensored.com.